to her mother's funeral, so said she had to get a housekeeper for Billy, and all that. Although Barbara and her husband were having to look after Billy's business interests, which were considerable, since Billy didn't seem to give a damn for business anymore, all this responsibility at such an early age made her a bitchy flippage of it, and Billy, meanwhile, was trying to hang on to his dignity to persuade Barbara and everybody else that he was far from senile. That, on the contrary, he was devoting himself to calling much higher than mere business. He was doing nothing less now, he thought, than prescribing corrective lenses for earthling souls. So many of those souls were lost and wretched, Billy believed, because that they could not see as well as the little green friends on Tremalfador. Don't lie to me, father, said Barbara. I know perfectly well you heard me when I called. This was a fairly pretty girl, except she had no legs like an, an Edwardian grand piano. Now she raised hell with him about the letter in the paper. She said he was making her a laughing stock of himself and everybody associated with him. Father, 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 said Barbara. What are we going to do with you? Are you going to force us to put you where your mother is? Billy's mother was still alive. She was in a bed in an old people's home called Pine Knoll at the edge of Ilium. What is it about my letter that makes you so mad? Billy wanted to know. It's all just crazy. None of it's true. It's all true. Billy's anger was not going to rise with hers. He never got mad at anything. He was wonderful that way. There is no such planet as Tremalfador. It, it can't be detected from Earth, if that's what you mean, said Billy. Earth can't be detected from Tremalfador, as far as that goes. They're both very small and very far apart. Where did you get a crazy name like Tremalfador? That's what the creatures who live there call it. Oh, God, said Barbara, and then she turned back to him. She celebrated frustration by clapping her hands. May I ask you a simple question? Of course. Why is it that you never mentioned any of this before the airplane crash? I didn't think the time was ripe. And so on. Billy says that he first came unstuck in time in 1944, long before his trip to Tremalfador. The Tremalfadorians didn't have anything to go with his coming unstuck. They were simply able to give him insights into what was really going on. Billy first came unstuck while World War II was in progress. Billy was a chaplain's assistant in the war. A chaplain's assistant is customarily a figure of fun in the American army. Billy was no exception. He was powerless to harm the enemy or to help his friends. In fact, he had no friends. He was a valet to a preacher, expected no promotions or medals, bore no arms, and had a meek faith in loving Jesus, which almost all soldiers found putrid. While on maneuvers in South Carolina, Billy played hymns he knew from his childhood, playing them on a little black organ which was waterproof. It had 39 keys and two stops. Vox Humana, Vox Celesti. Billy had also charge of a portable altar, an olive jabotachi with telescoping legs. It was lined with crimson plush, and nestled in the passionate plush were an anodized aluminum cross and a Bible. The altar and the organ were made by a vacuum cleaner company in Cabinet, New Jersey, and said so. One time on maneuvers, Billy was playing A Mighty Fortress is Our God, with music by Jonathan Sebastian Bach and words by Martin Luther. It was Sunday morning. Billy and his chaplain had gathered a congregation of about 50 soldiers on the Carolina hillside. An umpire appeared. There were umpires everywhere. Men who said who was winning or losing the theoretical battle, who was alive and who was dead. The umpire was comical news. The congregation had been theoretically spotted from air by a theoretical enemy. They were all theoretically dead now. The theoretical courses, corpses laughed and ate a hearty noontime meal. Remember this incident years later. Billy was struck by what a Tremalfadorian adventurer with death that had been. <laughs> to be dead and to eat at the same time. Towards the end of maneuvers, 
Billy was given an emergency for low home because his father, a barber in Ilium, New York, was shot dead by a friend while he was hunting deer. So it goes. When Billy got back from his fur lore, there were orders for him to go overseas. He was needed in the headquarters company of an, inter of an infantry regiment fighting in Luxembourg. The regimental chaplain's assistant had been killed in action. So it goes. When Billy had joined the regiment, he was in the process of being destroyed by Germans in the famous Battle of the Bulge. Billy never even got to meet the chaplain he was supposed to assist, was never even issued a steel helmet or combat boots. This was December 1944, during the last mighty German attack of the war. Billy survived, but he was dazed. He was a dazed wanderer, far behind the German lines. Three other wanderers, not so dazed, allowed Billy to tag along. Two of them were scouts, and one was an anti-tank gunner. They were without food or maps, avoiding Germans. They were delivering themselves into a rural silence, even more profound. They ate snow. They went Indian file. First came the scouts, clever, graceful, quiet. They had rifles. Next came the anti-tank gunner, clumsy and dense, warning Germans away with a Colt 45, automatic in one hand, and a trench knife in the other. Last came Billy Pilgrim, empty-handed, bleakly ready for death. Billy was preposterous, six feet, three inches tall, with a chest and shoulders like a box of kitchen matches. He had no helmet, no overcoat, no weapon, and no boots. On his feet were cheap, low-cut civilian shoes, which he had bought for his father's funeral. Billy had lost a heel, which made him bob up and down, up and down, then volunteering dancing, up and down, up and down, made his hip joints sore. Billy was wearing a thin field jacket, a shirt and trousers of scratchy wool, the long underwear that was soaked with sweat. But he was the only one of the four which had bread. It was a random, bristly bread, and some of the bristles were white. Though Billy was only 21 years old, he was also going bald. Wind and cold and violent exercise had turned his face crimson. He didn't look like a soldier at all. He looked like a filthy flamingo. In the third day of wandering, somebody shot at the four from far away. Shot four times. As they crossed a narrow brick road, one shot was for the scouts. The next was for the anti-tank gunner, whose name was Ronald Weary. The third bullet was for the filthy flamingo, who stopped dead center in the road where the lethal bee buzzed past his ear. Billy stood there politely, giving the marksman another chance. It was his addled understanding of the rules of warfare that the marksman should be given a second chance. The next shot missed Billy's kneecaps by inches, going end to end from the sound of it. Ronald Weary and the scouts were safe in the ditch, and Weary growled at Billy, Get out of the road, you dumb motherfucker! The last words were still a novelty in the speech of white people in 1944. It was fresh and astonishing to Billy, who had never fucked anybody. And it did its job. It woke him up and got him off the road. Saved your life again, you dumb bastard! Weary said to Billy in the ditch. He had been saving Billy's life for days, cursing him, kicking him, slapping him, making him move. It was absolutely necessary that cruelty be used, because Billy wouldn't do anything to save himself. Billy wanted to quit. He was cold, hungry, embarrassed, and incompetent. He could scarcely distinguish between sleep and wakefulness now. On the third day, he found no important differences, either between walking and standing still. He wished somebody would leave him alone. You guys going on without me? He said again and again. Weary was a new, Weary was a, as new to the war as Billy. He was a replacement too. As part of a gun crew, he had helped him to fire one shot in anger from a 57 millimeter anti-tank gun. The gun made a ripping sound like the opening of a zipper in a fly of God Almighty. The gun lapped up snow and, ve and vegetation with a blowtorch 30 feet long. The flame left a black arrow in the ground showing the Germans exactly where the gun was hidden. The shot was a miss. What had been missed was a tiger tank. It swiveled its 88 millimeter snout around sniffingly, saw the arrow on the ground. It fired. 
It killed everybody on the gun crew, but